So good morning, thanks for joining us. Uh, it looks like it's going to be one of those mornings delivered, um, I think if I'm right, Brian, over 40 webinars we've done as a team. Uh, and this is the first one I've had technical difficulties with, which is just typical um, as a way to finish it off. Um, <clears throat> so the, the idea with the the, the journals, um, it was something that I'd seen when I was in class. Um, we just started to use them um, before I left the school to join Education Scotland. Um, and I thought it'd be an absolutely... Um, grand idea to explore in a, in a more digital manner than um, than what we were doing when I was at school. So I've got a few examples of how people have used these um, learning journals to, to support learning and I'd like to just talk you through some of the ideas behind that. Again, as I always say, I, I don't think I'm, I'm going to reinvent the wheel or, or um, show them anything that they've, they've maybe never seen before, but I'm hoping that maybe to apply it in a digital context is, is, is the wee part that we're, we're able to take away from today. Um, <clears throat> So, um, the session today we're going to look at is digital journals. Um, when we think about digital stuff and why it's so important, uh, there's a quote there on the screen from the, the OECD and you can see the figures uh, in the wee chart from Skills Development Scotland. Um, and digital is so important to the Scottish economy, in fact, the, the world economy. And, and with those digital skills and, and digital literacy, um, learners are able to work absolutely anywhere. Um, my favourite story is still the, the fact that the, the person who runs Billy Joel's Twitter account works, and I think it's up in Fife uh, somewhere, um, for a social media management company. So, again, you can work for a huge international uh, recording artist and, and still live um, in, in Scotland um, without having to travel to America to work in an office. So, digital skills and digital literacy really do open up the world for us. And more and more, um, in fact, I think we've probably we've, we've passed the point of any job in the world that doesn't require digital skills. Um, whether you think, um, certainly as a, as a teacher, you know, my payslip was I, I had to access that through an online system. I had to apply for my job online. So even if you weren't using it day to day, um, you, you're requiring digital skills to either, um, sometimes the example is, a, you know, somebody who, who you know, digs digs the roads and stuff, but if they say, you know, well, they might not be using it day to day to access it, but the chances are maybe to locate a road that they're going to, that might be an online map to, to access tools or, or safety equipment that's possibly bought for an online store. So there's, there's, any job in the world you can think of, there is some level of digital literacy required in that. So as we go forward, and I know we've had some messages recently um, from the um, from the government about how schools will return, uh, and some people might feel that they, they won't need their blended learning because they might be going back to school as, as was, but we've always done blended learning. Um, you know, if you consider any sort of learning at home that you've done, so homework, etc., We've always had a part that's done online, so I think there's still um, a real opportunity to, to take forward the work that we've, lots of us have, have made strides in with digital and, and to keep progressing with that. So hopefully you still find this uh, useful, whether or not you have learners in, out of school, half-time, full-time. I still think these um, the ideas in here would be relevant if learners are in school all of the time. Um, <clears throat> what we've done um, is digital, uh, digital skills team D Education Scotland. We've made these digital vision diagrams. Um, so there's the digital learner one available on the screen just now. And what we've done is taken the E's and O's, principles and practices, all those policy statements, um, and we've put them into simple, easy to use diagrams. So if you're planning anything for your learners, the one of the best places to start is is with that digital vision diagram and think, how am I going to teach one of these statements, or which one of these statements? bundles with my social subjects learning or my, my science or my maths, my literacy, my PE. If I'm doing any other subject area, how can I plug one of these in and how can I make it cross-curricular with digital? So these are really useful and effective diagrams and I think as well as we think about going back to school in August, there's the digital um, ELC in primary school one and the secondary school one is, is very similar. Um, those are available on digilearn.scot under digital visions um, and there's a diagram for a, a range of teacher, learner, schools, local authority head teacher. But possibly as a school you're thinking about what will our digital policy, what will our digital learning look like um, and, and there are the five statements that, that we would suggest um, you aim for. So if, if you're thinking about your school, how are we going to go back to um, have a, a digital presence and a digital policy when we go back? I think that's a, a perfect starting place before you, you really start to go into any policies or, or documents in, in depth. There they are at a glance. So 
<clears throat> well worth having a look at those and, and seeing if they prove useful to you. What I've also tried to capture at the, the kind of core of everything that, that we do as a team, we're always thinking about where creativity can can, can go into the digital um, areas and, and digital literacy allows our learners to be so so much more creative. If you think of, um, it doesn't even have to be Hollywood films these days, but um, you know films with special effects and, and learners are able to manipulate green screens um, very, very cheaply or, or freely on iPads and, and other mobile devices. So the, the tools are there for learners and we've got to provide them with the skills that, that allow them to, to use those, but the, there's an opportunity to be so creative um, and again, what I'm hoping with the, the idea behind this journal is, is they're really open to the learners, how they, they may tackle what they, what notes they take or, or how they represent any information. And that again lends itself to that creativity. So um, to be able to support learners to develop these four creativity skills that you can see on the screen. And I'm going to dip in at a wee point. Um, spoke with one of my colleagues in the Creative Team Education Scotland. Um, Stephen shared a link to some videos that are already on YouTube. Um, if you've got access to these slides which I've put up in the Teams, you'll see there's a wee link at the top for the Creativity Toolbox on YouTube playlist there, um, where Stephen Bullock takes you through some, some ideas to help you get um, perhaps more um, creative when you're solving problems. So I'm gonna, um, I've am going got a wee video to play from that, um, and I think that, that can really be central to everything that you do, um, and as well as the digital literacy. You've got the digital skill side where anything to do with computing science is about solving a problem. That that's why computers exist. They're there to solve problems for us. So again, it's about putting them into that context. So so creativity is really at the core of everything we try to do in the digital team. And I hope that kind of comes through and, and we can see where we can be a wee bit more creative with our um, note taking or journal making and, and how we can use that um, for learning and teaching and indeed um, even assessment. So. Um, when we think about how we plan for, for our learners, we've obviously got the, the refreshed narrative and the curriculum there. And oh, again, if we're creative and we're using digital, we can we can use that in all four of these areas, uh, all four <clears throat> parts of the learner there. And again, as we move forward through the moderation cycle, when we're starting to plan learning activities, just have that think at the start about where can we get the creativity to, to really come through and how can I use digital, whether it's to make something happen that wasn't possible before. I mentioned things like green screens or um, audio recordings, um, animations, um, coding, things that you couldn't really do before you had access to digital technology. But also thinking about how can I use the digital technology to, to support, um, or even as we've seen in the last couple of months, how to enable stuff that we perhaps took for granted. So if you're teaching maths with a textbook and a jotter or a worksheet and you're using concrete um, materials in the classroom and all of a sudden you don't have those learners in front of you to do those things the way you've always done them, how can we use digital technology to enable it, us to do that? So, so thinking about where digital fits in at that planning stage and obviously the learner and the learner's choice and the learner's needs are always at the centre of that. <clears throat> so again, what I've, I've taken here, um, just again, a wee bit of support. I've used second level because it's, it's, it's sort of in the middle between early and um, fourth level there, but um, to think about how we use digital technology, we can use that um, to organise information and to, to represent it in appropriate ways. And that's what I'm hoping to show you, to demonstrate today. And I've taken there's a, a number of literacy easy notes there, so right through the curriculum, um, that, that literacy um, thread goes, and, and there's, there's bits there about note making. So it doesn't have to be as formal in a journal about having headings and stuff, but you might want to consider that. So. Just a start of a 10, there's some easy ones that I'm going to sort of think about or reference as I go through this. Um, there's a bit of information in here. Again, the blended learning, I don't know what approach your schools are going to be taking just now, but there are, there are some approaches um, outlined there that one of my colleagues from the maths team shared with us about, you know, whether it's on-site or, or online. As I say, we've always done blended learning because, you know, I think every school in Scotland delivers homework uh, or home learning activities or or whatever you call that, whatever it looks like. So there's always a part of learning that takes place outside the school. We've always got learners doing their own things and coming into school and showing off their achievements, whether that's karate, swimming, playing the bagpipes, whatever that is. The learners are always, always, um, our young people and children are always learning new things, um, and, and that should um, ideally blend with what's happening in school. <clears throat> Digital really helps us to support that because it means that learners can learn anywhere at any time. Um, and if we're able to capture that in the primary school, the secondary school, early years, whatever else you're working, um, 
we can use that digital technology to, to make that wee bit more fluid between the sites. So <clears throat> there's some reading there that might help um, with your approach. And again, um, this model, um, the, the, the journal idea I'm talking about, could go between being a, a flipped um, approach or a traditional approach. So what I was thinking about was <clears throat> with these, um, the, the blended learning journal is, is something that you could... Um, do with your learners whether they're in front of you or they're outside of the class but i think there would be a part of it you would have to model it certainly in front you could use different approaches and um, such as having a tutorial about how to do them but i think it's something that you would do with learners in front of you and it's going to support their learning when they are um, at home or, or working individually in the classroom however that's going to look so last wee part just a, a reminder that we've got our what digital learning might look like document available in the improvement hub at education scotland and um, also if you search Twitter or the internet for what digital learning might look like, you'll find links to the document as well. Early through to second level for now, um, and, and there's loads of ideas about how you can embed digital literacy and digital skills right across um, the, your learners' um, experiences in the classroom, out the classroom. Um, so well worth having a look at that there. So as I said at the start, we've got to <coughs> plan for the needs of our learners. And this was um, an idea that was introduced um, when I was still in school through a, a, a programme called Maths Talks. And the idea being that as the teacher teaches new concepts in math, the learners keep a math journal as they go and, and they can make that look however they want it to look. And it's really giving the learners that freedom and that creativity to, to make their own notes that they're able to then go back and refer to. But I thought that was a, a, an area I did it with literacy as well. Um, that you could really apply in any area of the cur curriculum is, is allowing learners to keep that learning journal as they go, um, make it their own, and how they do that. So one of the, the other parts that's really advantageous with this is if your learners are keeping the journal of the key concepts as they go, it means when you come to planning a new topic and you're thinking about your assessment, you can always do that pre-assessment, that knowledge check on, on their journals, get them to go back, revisit that, and see what they do know um, before you move forward so it's really handy having that journaling of um, ideas and concepts and again you could take that across the examples I've got here are for, for numeracy we could take it across the whole curriculum <clears throat> so here's just a few examples you can see here the learners um, from, from this class so that was shared by um, a former colleague uh, Chris Barron at, at Merns Primary and um, the learners have been learning this lattice method um, for calculations and maths and you can see just if I go between these two screens there's two different learners, different journals, it's the same concept but one learner's put more diagrams, um, they've coloured in all the different parts and, and this learner's got more writing so it really is down to what suits the learner. Um, <clears throat> and the beauty with this is that the learners have then got this noted in their maths journal, they can go back to that at any point, so if they get stuck on something or they're not sure of moving forward, they've got their own notes to go back to um, and check, so that's really important for developing their independence. The learners are then trained to use these these notes, the, the journal that they keep um, to support themselves, so that they're not always coming back to the teacher, so if you're thinking about learners, whether they're um, if they are going to be learning at home, that they've got that independence, they've got the support materials. If you're putting notes like this in your maths jotter, the chances are that jotter's not going home with the learner. So when they're at home, they're then stuck. Um, and, and, and if they've got this digitally, which is the, what I'd like to demonstrate in a moment, they're going to be able to work on it at home um, in school and, and keep it running um, between the two places um, without having to cart jotters backwards and forwards. Um, it means that they're able to support themselves, but also <laughs> if you're demonstrating um, some work examples which are learning, they then have on their journal, I think if I'm right, it's around about a, um, a third of adults in Scotland um, don't feel confident at supporting their eight plus year old child with, with numeracy and maths. So it's a huge number of people in Scotland, I've, I've not got the figure to hand for that exactly to, to give you that reference, but I heard that just before Christmas, I thought that's a huge amount of people who don't have that confidence and I know that the numeracy and maths team are, are always working to try and develop that confidence in numeracy the, the way that people are confident perhaps with their literacy but if you've got adults at home supposed to be supporting learners and they don't know how to do this lattice method and I think it's a headache I've heard from quite a few teachers who are saying we've worked so hard on these different counting methods with concrete pictorial and, and the abstract process where wanting to show learners how to do different methods, accounting, bar modelling, lattice methods, 
counting sticks, um, cruising air rods and, and using all these different resources and then they go home, their adults don't know how to support them so they go straight back to a formal calculation um, where they put them in a tower and they, they, they add them in the exchange and they carry etc. And, and that can then take away some of that confidence from the learner because teachers saying one thing and adults showing them something different and it can almost unpick some of the learning that's happened. So I've heard that from a few um, teachers that I know are saying that they've, they've worked on this. It'd be great if we could had a model to support it at home. So I think if you've got the learners making these journals with how it's done, as the teacher's explaining it, it's got some worked examples in there that the teacher's shown and the learners perhaps copying some of it and then adding their own notes around that. That could be really useful to support um, adults at home who might not be familiar with those methods. So again, I might not know the to be last, determined. I might not know the lattice method myself as an adult, but if I'm looking at that, I could perhaps pick through some of that and support my learner with with that. So it's it's another idea again. If we're able to take these journals between school, here's an example I got from a learner who the, the the class have started to use. Um, to create a digital version of it and I think that's absolutely great they're talking about their bar modeling there and, and they've used some you know whether that's word processing or an art package there to start to create some graphics so they are thinking about how they're doing it digitally and again the beauty is if that's in their Google Classroom or Microsoft team they're able to again go and access that so what I'm hoping to take you through is some other tools and um, that we can actually take the notes a bit like this but we can make them digital, which allows us to go between school and home. So the two tools uh, I'm going to go in and demonstrate are using OneNote uh, on a Microsoft platform and Jamboard through Google. So every every um, everyone in Scotland has access, every educator um, has access to, or every teacher rather has definitely got access to Glow. Um, Microsoft is automatically enabled. Your local authority has got to request Google, um, so Classroom and G Suite have got to be requested by your local authority. So you might not have access to the Google tools I'm talking about if that's not been um, enabled for you. Um, so that's maybe a discussion to have with your ICT coordinator, your Glow key contact, if that's a tool you think you, you would benefit from. But the OneNote is definitely available to all Glow users. So um, that, that's where I've covered the, the two here. Um, so what I'd like to do is just show you quickly a, a quick overview of the tools. So if I go and open up my OneNote um, that I made earlier. So hopefully you can see my OneNote here on the screen. Now, OneNote is just a digital notebook. That's the easiest way to, to, to describe it. It's built in as part of Teams. So if you're using Teams um, and you've got that set up for your class, you'll see it called Class Notebook at the top. And if you're using a, a learning um, community or a, a, um, the, the school set up for Teams among staff, it will be called uh, Staff Notebook or um, some sort of notebook at the top of the screen in Teams. But um, you can access it as itself in a standalone app here. So this is one note, and, and as I say, it works as part of Teams. You'll probably be familiar with it if you've if you've been using Teams. The beauty of it is, is it's it's a it's, it's just a big digital notebook. As I say, it's pages, and you can ink on it. You can write straight to the screen, which is really handy. Again, more and more people have access to mobile devices, um, which means touch screen is 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 built, built in. So it's really handy to be able to write on that. Um, there, just to be set, I've got a flash on Teams. I'm just going to double check that. Is that all right, Brian? We're still good there. Um, so looks okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, down the left hand side, I've got these sections. So within one note, you get to set up sections. Um, so I've called mine by different parts of the, the learning. So I've got a math section, I've got a spelling section, comprehension. It's, so. Again, you can order and organise. So rather than just having a big jotter or having even a math jotter, a literacy jotter, a social subjects jotter, you know, um, jotters for different parts of the curriculum, you could have a window um, where they can keep all of their learning. So their journal might be a certain section within that or this might be their journal window and they've got a section for each area of the curriculum. It's entirely up to you and your learners how you might want to organise that. So the first example, if I, if I can demonstrate to you here, is a maths one. And I don't know if you're familiar um, with the, the VIP, so the important um, product. Here I've got um, a counting stick, and all I've done is I've, I've copied that from Maths Bot. 
Um, so if you're familiar with the MathBot website, but they have a, a section for manipulatives. So it's really handy if you've, you know, you've got learners that have been using concrete materials in school um, and you, they don't necessarily have a count and stick at home. You can go to MathBot, it's free. Uh, there's a section on um, manipulatives and all I've used is the snipping tool which is built into Windows. Um, so again, you could copy and paste that screen, um, take a screenshot on, on your iPad and, and cut it down to just around the size of the, the counting stick. So there's different ways of getting that. You can draw a counting stick here, um, but for the purposes, I've just copy and pasted one in. Um, so on this example, we are working on the four times table. So what I've got in the bottom is my multiples. So four times one, four times two, four times three, through to four times 10. Um, again, if I'm teaching anyone to suck eggs here, I do apologize. I hope that's a, a maths concept that's familiar and I'm getting it right. Uh, so maths isn't my specialist area. Um, and what I've got at the top then are the products. So um, if I'm going on the principle of learning the four times table, it's it's likely that my learner knows the one times table, obviously, the two times table, the five and the ten times table. So it means that my learner is straight away able to tell me four ones are four, four twos are eight, four fives are 20 and four tens are 40. And the beauty is, if I can just show you here, um, if I go up to draw um, and I can select, I'm already in the pencil and I can select a colour here. My learner could, that could be a worked example I, I've given to my learner, but what I'd hope is if I'm demonstrating this is a way of counting in the class, I want my learner to take a worked example that they're able to use and go back and support themselves at home. It's then up to them how they use colours and pictures and anything else to support that learning. But the idea being here that if I know four twos are eight, I know that the next step, four times three, is just adding on another four, but, but, but it's just repeated, repeated adding. So if I'm doing eight, add on four, I'm going to get to 12 and add on another four, it'll take me to 16. I can apply the same for 20 plus four is going to give me 24. And if I'm going backwards from here, so it could also work backwards if they know 36 and they can go count back four, four eights would then be 32. So they can go through and complete these worked examples. They can make them bright, they can make them colourful. But what I found really useful about OneNote is it lets me just draw on the screen in a way that Microsoft Word or PowerPoint um, or, or Docs or Slides, if you're using Google, it, it won't let you do that very easily. So it's really handy. Again, you can ink in PowerPoint, but I don't feel it lends itself to, to this sort of working. Um, so again, you can get learners to go through and do examples of how they are doing the, that addition, that counting. Again, I've got an example here for fractions. So if I was the teacher and I was speaking about fractions to the class, <clears throat> this is the sort of notes I might expect my learner to take. So they're taking down the key words there. It's about equal parts. They're, these are some of the examples that I may have drawn on the board and my learner has copied those and then they've maybe done their own interpretation of that. So they're drawing different shapes and showing how a half is each part of the thing. Makes them think about pizza. So they can be really creative here with how they take their notes. And that's what we'd like to encourage is that learners are free to, to do this in different ways. They can they can draw on the screen. They can write on the screen. Again, you can see here I've got the, with the text tool. If I have to, I can then say... So for this moment, we're just talking about equal parts of a thing. So that statement would be fine. Um, obviously, it can be a, an equal part of a number or an equal amount of a number too. Um, but we can still type. So if you feel the handwriting is a wee bit um, scrawly, but the idea is it's, it's the learner, so they should have the ownership on that. Um, but they could also have some typed notes as well. They can even use the insert button and go to audio. Um, and in a way that you can't do with a jotter, they can take down a note. So the learner could say, oh, I need to remember um, fractions. Um, if I cut a pizza in two, it's not necessarily a, a half unless it is exactly equal on both sides. And they've then got a voice recording of that. So again, they can listen back to any notes. So if, whatever suits your learner, they might want to record a statement that's going to support the learning. They might want to draw a picture, write some notes, type some notes. However they want to take the notes, they're able to do that. So they've now got an audio recording. So if they look back in this in a month's time and they don't remember why they've drawn a pizza, they can click on the wee audio recording um, and it will it will play that back for them so they can hear themselves taking the notes um, by voice. 
Another one I wanted to just show um, different way of using pictures and things. Um, for example, your active spelling could be done. So when they're, they're practicing their spelling again, rather than just having lists in their jotters and taking the jotter between home, they could have some of this done in school and been able to do it at home as part of their homework and it's all in the same place. So different um, active strategies there for spelling. So we've got ra rainbow letters, loopy letters, bubble letters, whatever you do. Um, again, learners got choice there and they're able to go and grab using the insert tool. They can just insert a picture um, either from the computer, from the camera or from the web. So if they needed one for a bat, um, and they can use Bing to search for that. And you can see there's a picture of a bat. So I can stick that in and then they could practice. So again, really to let learners, it's up to them, the pictures they choose how they represent those words but if you're doing things like that where learners have got that bit of freedom and creativity that, that bit of choice then using a journal like this lets them they've got different colors different te um, inking tools they've got the pen the highlighter or they can type they can record um as, as they need to so it's it's really useful for the learner to have that and um, just a quick example i did with literacy i really like the screening shots resources that are on glow i don't know if you use those for your literacy but there are films that are free to use on glow they're in screening shots um and again one of the, the methods for teaching that film is to let learners listen to the film without seeing the pictures and they take notes so again i would have done this in my jota when i was in school but now um seeing the power of one note i would definitely have it done in a one note page uh, and that means that they're able to go back and revisit it at any time so they can take notes and again, you could use a table in Microsoft Word, but sometimes it's nice to be able to, to do that. They could even um, insert a picture if they heard a violin under the music. They could even put a picture in. So it's supporting learners um, to learn their way. Um, and the last one I want to just show very quickly before I show you the, the Google Jamboard stuff. Uh, if they're doing a topic, perhaps, and they've been learning all about locks in Scotland, so they can draw a wee picture here with the ink. Um, they can type and they can highlight around it so they're able to draw their attention to their own bits. Here's some notes they've made. Loch Ness got the most water, Loch Lomond's the biggest area. They can grab a picture of Nessie um, and put in that there's a, a legendary monster that lives in that body of water. Also, because it's digital, again, in a, in a way that um, I, I think we're absolutely at a point where we can move forward from finding information on the internet and saving it to the computer that they're working on, forgetting the file name or the folder and, and nobody able to access that again, or, or having to print things, cut them and put them into a jotter when you've got a digital jotter like this. Here's a picture of Loch Awe that we found. Here is um, a Google map. Um, I don't know if you're aware of Google map. If you right click on the image, you can measure distances. So just from end to end, um, there's the 34.27 kilometers. So Loch Awe is the longest loch in Scotland. And we can take this snip from Google maps. We can take um, an image from the web and that really would help the learner hopefully to, to remember what they're doing because they have taken the notes. Now the beauty is when I thought about this approach it was about supporting the learners to support themselves. How do they take notes? How do they remember? How do they support themselves when they're learning independently? How do they share their learning with an adult or, or, or a, a peer? Um, and the fact is that they've got their own notes here. But also if they're doing this in their class notebook um, and you've got access to that for me, that's really becoming a piece of assessment as well, because if that's the notes they're taking, I can look at that as a teacher and not only is it supporting the learner, but it's supporting me as the teacher to make a judgment that they know this information or that they should know this information because they've made those notes and perhaps that's what I want to talk to them about. I want to quiz them on and, and see if they, they have retained that, that knowledge that they've taken notes on. And again, if they haven't retained it, they've forgotten it, they've got their notes to go back and visit. So the beauty is, again as I keep saying it this is done digitally so if they do this in the classroom when they go home whether they've got access to mum's laptop or dad's desktop or whatever it is they've got their own mobile phone a, a tablet an ipad whatever it is they can still log in to go on any mobile uh, on any internet device and they can access this so even if they took these notes in class on a, a chromebook or a laptop when they're at home they could open up their mobile phone and they can access their notes again so one of the ones we have heard during lockdown is perhaps an adult in the house is using the device, the, the main laptop, the family computer, or a sibling is using the laptop and, and, and the, the other learner isn't able to get on to access the learning. But with, with 
but the fact that they're using OneNote and Go, they can access it on any kind of device at all. So that they're able to to get um, access to their notes. So that could support them to go away and do some 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 drawing or some writing or some reading. Brian, have I got any questions coming in about OneNote just before I go to the the Jamboard? Yeah, I was um uh, just uh, I, I take an answer here. I'm just asking um where pupils access their OneNote. So, and, and how did you create OneNote? And I was about to talk about Teams and it generates uh, uh, a OneNote document for you and put in a link to the OneNote uh, webinar that we did. So I don't know if you can really show that just now. If you just pop into Teams and show where the um, uh, OneNote is. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're in Glow, um, it's my Glow blogs, Glow Launchpad here. So if you're in Glow, you can if you've got the Microsoft the the Office 365 um, tile here, you can go into that and you can access all of the Office apps that are available through Glow. One of which is OneNote, um, so you can access OneNote from there, and you can create just a standalone OneNote, um, which might be useful for the learners for their own journals. Um, you can also at any point if you're in Office 365 on Glow, you can go up to the wall on the top left corner and you'll find all the apps. Again, OneNote is there. But where I think OneNote really comes into its own, um, where it really works is with Teams. So, for example, if I go um, into my Teams, I've got a demo team I'll use. So when you create a class team, um, a team for your class, um, it automatically creates a class notebook. So the class notebook has a few areas um, that are a wee bit different from just using OneNote. Um, the first section you'll get is, you'll get these sections on the left hand side that Microsoft automatically create when you go in. Um, I may have deleted them, I'll show you in a wee second when my OneNote loads. So as you see, it looks exactly the same as my OneNote did. I'm just now using it in a, in a team. So here are my sections, here are my pages, uh, and here is the page that I'm working on currently, just like I was in um, OneNote. You can also stretch that with the expand tab so that it gets rid of your, the teams on the left hand side and you can just see your OneNote a wee bit better to work with. Um, so again, I've got sections here, but what it does is it builds in with Teams is a collaboration space. In a collaboration space, anyone in the team can, can write, draw, access, and edit that. So that would be a good space to work as a class. If you're doing any class or group work, they could do that on the collaboration space. You also get, as the teacher, you get a content library where you can put information that learners can access, but they cannot edit. So if you've got class notes, if you've got, um, I know a CDT teacher um, who put the whole course at work into a content library um, as he went, and it meant it was always there, but there's some content available ahead of time. So learners could look at it, they can read it, but they can't edit it. So they can't go in and change the class notes for somebody else. It's always the way the teacher left it. But you have control over the content library, the pupils don't. And then you can see here within Teams in the class notebook, every learner has their own OneNote um, class notebook, and that is private to that learner, so, um, and yourself. So you can see their class OneNote, they can see it, but other pupils can't. So the collaboration space is great if you want to do a kind of class summit, you want to get ideas from the class together. Um, however, if you want learners having their own individual learning, then it's the, the class notebook and their own notebook. Um, to write in there. You can then go back and look at that and you can give them feedback on their learning, you can assess them, they can use it but other learners can't see it so it's private to them and you. Um, so again if you want individuals learning in their own notebook, if you want them working as a, a group or a team, you could create a page in the collaboration space and they can all contribute to that. Could I just come in there for a second George? Yeah, so um, uh, OneNote is uh, one of those tools that I think some people have been a little bit afraid of. Um, but in terms of creating a, a digital journal, as George is demonstrating, learners can interact with it and they can write on it, they can type on it, they can add, they can add um, uh, audio. They can also upload photos, they can upload videos, they can 
uh, embed other parts. So if they've done a scratch project, for example, they can they take, take the embed code and they can paste it in into into their OneNote. But within within Microsoft Teams, in your in your class notebook that you have, you end up having pages for every learner. Um, so they can they can have their own personal private notebook, which you can access via via that um, uh, that tool. It's it, it takes a wee bit of time to kind of get used to because it's a slightly different um, application to the more traditional ones like PowerPoint and Word, but it does have that 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 power of having the kind of teacher area, the collaboration area, and then all the individual um, pupils in your class. I posted a link to the OneNote tutorial we did. Um, about seven or eight weeks ago, and it lasts about fifty-five minutes. But it but it goes through the, the it goes through how to create a OneNote um, for yourself, or then or how to use OneNote Class Notebook um, with your class. Um, so if you do have an hour or so over over the summer, and you're interested in in learning more, grab yourself a cup of coffee and a cake, and you know and watch it. Um, Susan and Jenny who um, did it uh, are really quite experienced in using OneNote, and um, the feedback we've had on that particular uh, what that particular um, session has been has been really good. So I'm um, going take a bit of time to have a look at it. Right, so I'll let you go back to that. Uh, transferring class notebooks to the next year. Uh, yes, you can. Um, I, I can't quite remember how to do it off the top of my head, but you can take the content from um, from from one uh, class notebook and import it into another one. I think there's a couple of ways to do it, but I'll find the links and I'll post them in there. So sorry, George, I'll let you get back to, to um, uh, Jamboard. When I first saw it in school, I thought, oh, don't know how to use that. Um, I'll come back to that one. Um, but once you start to use it, you realise, I mean, for me, the beauty is you, you can do what you want on it. I think you covered in that. You can put photos, videos, sound, edit it they can just write on it if they've got their mobile phone they can just simply write on the screen with their finger so um it's it's really flexible and adaptable um which I, I think makes it such a good tool and i think to carry it forward if i'm right i think um obviously you'll get the links for us but the um i think you've got to access it through one note um separate from teams to be able to copy that if, if i'm right one of the ones jambled for me is a kind of lesser known app. I, I never hear as much about it as I, I would I would think you would. Um, what I want to show first though before jambled, it, it sits a wee bit separate from the other G Suite apps, um, and it, it, it doesn't quite go in. So if I'm setting classwork in my Google Classroom, um, so I created a, a maths assignment here, and when I was creating that assignment, um, pardon me, gonna have to edit it to show you. When I created the assignment, I, I can create and I can put in docs, slides, sheets, drawings, forms, which are our G Suite apps, but it doesn't let me embed Jamboard automatically. So what you have got to do, if you want to put a Jamboard in for your class to work on, there's a few ways to do it, but for me, the best way, the most straightforward way is if you use a link and you paste the Jamboard link, and I'll show you the Jamboard link in a wee second. So once you've created your Jamboard you want learners to work on, get the link for it, and paste it as part of your assignment or you could put it in the stream on your class wherever you want to put it but i would create the jamboard first and then share it into classroom because the classroom doesn't have a, a means yet that i can see of just pulling a jamboard in so you've got to insert it as a link and i'll show you how to get that link as you see here i've got two jamboards here um where <clears throat> i've created one where students can edit the file and I want, that's because I want all my class to be able to contribute to this one Jamboard. So I've got lots of worked examples. They're working in groups, working with partners. They can all access this. But for assessment purposes, when I have created it, I've made the, the, this version of my Jamboard that each student will get a copy, which means that Classroom will create a new Jamboard for each pupil. So that, like we said about OneNote, I've got my collaborative version. And then I've got my assessment version, my individuals one. So if I want to see how Brian's getting on with his calculations or his topic learning, I can look at his Jamboard separate from the rest. So a couple of wee bits about how you use it. You want to add a link and you want to get the link for your Jamboard. And I'll show you that when we come to Jamboard. And then when you create it as part of an assignment on Classroom, you can either give students their access to view it. So again, a bit like content library in OneNote, you could make a, a Jamboard with, with five or six slides of what examples you want learners to look at but not touch you can make a version that they can edit so that they can work collaboratively as a class and they can all contribute to that um, perhaps some pupil voice or class conferences i say you want to get some ideas from across the class or from the group 
and then you can make it so that each student will get a copy and that means when they click on that link and open Jamboard it will create a new unique Jamboard for them. So Jamboard then to find, um, you've got to go into Google Classroom um, through um, Glow, so again on Glow, Google Classroom app, um, if you add that you come to Google Classroom and the waffle is in the top right corner this time just to make it different from Microsoft and you're looking for the Jamboard icon which is this one. Jamboard is very much the same as OneNote but for me there are, you can see I'm using that counting stick example quite a lot, I guess great, I can go in here, each Jamboard is there on my screen, I can go back and look at ones that I've done previously so it really lends itself to being a journal. This one's looking awfully blank and I'm hoping it's got my work to examples that I did yesterday. A wee second to jump. So again, it's not going to take as long. It's the exact same examples I did in OneNote. Now, I wanted to show that. It doesn't matter if you use Jamboard or use OneNote. You can do much the same with it. There's a few wee differences here with the tools on the left-hand side. On Jamboard, I've got sticky notes. So I can add a sticky note here. So this is the title of it. I want that done in text. So to put text on the screen, you have got to use um, a post-it. Um, you can change the colour of the post-its and those post-its that can then be rearranged um, and resized as you need to. So you can move those about the screen um, and again you can you can swivel them like that. So you can add text with the on OneNote you've got to add a wee text box. On Jamboard you've got to add um, a post-it. You want to add an image, you can add an image here. You can again use ones that are on your computer or you can Google search them. Um, so let's, uh, I'll come back to that example for the spelling one. <clears throat> so I can add images from here. I've got the rubber and I've got my pen. So again, a couple of different pens I can use. I've got my highlighter as well, just like in OneNote. So it's the same example I said, I've got my multiples. And again, I'm using a touchscreen device. Um, I could use my mouse. Um, so this one's three times table. So that would be, this is me using the mouse. Um, and again, if I'm using my stylus here, I can um, annotate straight to the screen. <clears throat> what I can do um, up here on the, so there's a few options, sorry I'll go through, you've got your undo button, I can zoom in, um, I'll demonstrate that, I've got another slide in a wee second, it's a wee bit better for that. You can put a different background on, which I believe you can do on the OneNote app if you have it as a totally standalone app out, you know, aside from using it online with Glow. I've heard, that can, I've not used it much so, but apparently you can put backgrounds in. Um, with Jamboard you can you can do that, that's a built in feature so you can add a different background so if you're doing some calculations or you're doing writing you can put an appropriate background in there um, or again if the learner just wants a, a different colour they can do that. You can wipe that away with the, the clear button but up here in the top right uh, the three wee dots um, sit at the top of each other. Again when I said about assessment purposes or to if, if just one particular part was useful, you can download this image as a PDF or save the frame as an image itself. You can make a copy, so you can, you can, you can take that one out if you've put it in the wrong place or it's 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 not what's needed. So to be able to capture it, again, you could use the screen snipping tool if you're on a Windows device or, or take a, a screen capture on your iPad, for example, or your mobile device. But you can also download a PDF um, and save the image. Um, so again, if you wanted to capture this to show, here's Brian's counting. Um, and I want to capture that and show um, as part of the assessment that he understands how to use the count and stick in that VIP concept. Um, I could take that as a PDF or a, a, an image and, and that's my, my assessment. That's how I can keep a record. To share, um, so as I said, to get it to your class, it's not embedded the way that OneNote's embedded in Teams. So uh, you can add specific people, but obviously if you've got a classroom, that might take a wee while. Um, what I would do is the link. So at the bottom here, change the link and you can choose only certain people, only people in your organisation, so that might be your local authority, your school, or um, for me, I'm going to use anyone with the link can access it. Again, I can then decide whether the reviewer or an editor, so you've got a wee bit of setup. Um, so if I wanted Brian to be able to access this, I would have anyone with the link, I would make it an editor's link, uh, and then I'm going to copy that link. I would then put that link back in my Google Classroom, so I could post it here for the class and all my learners have to do is click on that link in Classroom and it will take them to the Jamboard. So you've got a wee step to do in there that you don't have to with OneNote, but if you're using Google um, or you prefer the looks of Jamboard, um, it might be that it's a wee bit um, 
less on the screen compared to OneNote. That's sometimes something we hear, but again, the two tools are very similar. They, they work in slightly different ways. Here's the example I did for my literacy. As I say, I've got the lines here uh, on the screen. On OneNote, what you could do is you could take a, um, if you Google um, or search the internet for some lined paper, you could take a, a screen shot or a, a snip of that and put it into your OneNote and write on top of the lines if you like. Uh, I've done that before, but here's again the same activities I've done before, um, but I'm doing them on, on Jamboard and you can see how they work the exact same um, or very much the same as they do in OneNote. The same ideas, the same ways of working. As I said, I've got the zoom button, so it might be the, the, the boxes are quite small. So for me, I like to zoom in really close to them. Um, and again, as I say, I've just a wee worked example here of um, how you use the teacher maybe known as a journal in this case, if you're marking it up, but you could obviously mark on that. Um, and again, here you go, I can just write straight on my screen um, with the ink, and I'm able to, very much like I could, oh, make that an addition, um, just like I could in a jotter, I can do that on the screen, um, and you can just zoom in and out, which makes the, the squares a wee bit easier to work with. Um, and the last one there, again, the sort of idea that your social subjects, the topic board, much the same information as I had in the OneNote, um, but I can put these on. You could have a whole jam board just about your topic learning, your social subjects and, and how you're doing that. And, and they can capture, as I said, images. So I want to add an image of uh, Lock, um, so what an actual image of Lock all this time. I can search for that. You obviously want to check you know, that you're using images that, that are um, copyright um, cleared, but I think the fact you're not using it for any commercial purposes, you're, you're using it to take just a, a, an image. But I'll leave that up to you to, to have that discussion with your learners and decide what images they can and can't use, what purposes you can use images for. So um, I could shift that over there because that's about law court. And again, I can just grab it and rearrange them um, as I want to on Jamboard. So, there's some ideas about the tools that you could use. We're just about to finish. What I'd like to show you before I finish off is, I say I put these, what I love the most from, from the stuff that Stephen Bullock was presenting in the Creativity Toolbox was quest storming. So I said it's that you might want to talk about using headings. So perhaps you've got your headings here, um, and like this, these are your headings, and you're, you're talking about how to make them in a grid or in a list, a table, whatever literacy, you know, however you want to interpret that literacy, you know, about note making. Um, again, we can put pictures in to, to, to represent our thinking, um, but what I really like is the idea of, from brainstorming is to look at quest storming. So I'm going to just play this video from Stephen. Brainstorming can be an effective way of generating solutions to a challenge. Sometimes it can be difficult to find the right question or to see past your initial preconceptions on what needs to be done. For example, you might be wondering how to design a new literacy approach for your learners and spend lots of time generating wonderful solutions to that challenge, when the underlying problem might be that the learners aren't attending consistently, or they're bringing stresses from their home lives into the classroom. Sometimes another direct approach may Can't not be an effective sound. solution in your own time definitely worth watching but what Stephen talks about there is when we come to brainstorming rather than um, always try to just come up with answers from scratch what if we ask better questions so his example is if I am deciding whether to have um, what am I going to have for lunch rather than just thinking of ideas that I could have for lunch if I ask better questions so if I asked what did I have for breakfast what did I have for lunch yesterday what am I going to have for my tea tonight and if we ask those types of questions, we can start to eliminate answers and we get far closer to the answer that we want. So I thought that was a great idea in terms of a journal and asking learners to be a wee bit more creative and to, to be more independent in their thought. If we taught them how to quest storm, that would feed really well into these journals. So if they're thinking of better questions rather than just trying to come up with a, a, a multitude of answers, then that would um, support that method in the journals as well so i'll give you the link to watch Stephen explain that far better than i did um so last wee part here just to finish us off and um, just look at that blended approach there there's an example from one of my colleagues thinking about how they might take that forward um, in a maths con context 
about the learning to do in school. If you're creating that journal in school, it's going to support the learning at home. And also, as they develop their confidence in the journal, it means if you're giving them a tutorial um, or an instructional video, perhaps, to watch at home um, before they come back to school, or you're doing that as homework as we go forward, whatever that looks like, the fact that they're maybe going to start to use their journal independently and bring that back into the school with them. So if they do some research, for example, I showed the Scottish Locks one. If they did that as a learning at home activity, um, they, could, they don't have to bring that topic into the school. They can simply open up a device in the school, access Glow and show you the learning there or develop it further themselves. So if they're working on a poster at home and they can't bring it in and out to school every day, and they can only work on it at home or work on it in school. With Jamboard and OneNote, they can work on it at home and in school. And as I say, a kind of byproduct of it, that, that my first thought was really on how it would support the learners to learn, but actually it lends itself very well to assessment as well because you could then look at that and, and assess that if that's how you've um, intended it to be used. Um, there's some additional materials here just at the end of the slides um, shared by a colleague um, about ideas for flipped learning. Um, and um, some mathematical examples um, of using flipped and blended approaches. So that brings me to the end of my um, my webinar. I hope there were some things in there for you to take away, whether it was just the instructional part of how to use the tools, um, perhaps yeah, the so journal idea I, itself. I, um, uh, using the journal, my Wi-Fi say, signal dropped out, um, so, so uh, I kind of missed uh, a wee bit of that, but I can see a, thought, a question. Um, I said, does this link to Blooms by Mrs. Coventry? So I'm not quite sure which part of like your presentation um, she was referring to. It was about you know, about really five minutes ago, I think she posted that. So blended learning, which I say we've been doing blended learning for a long, long time. Um, learning at home and learning in school. Digital just makes that a wee bit more seamless for us um, where you can see working in any place at all um, and, and they're still able to access that. So I hope that's proved useful. Yeah, thank you very much for taking the time to that. Uh, and as this Brian said, dedicated here to the, the very last. So um, thanks for taking the time and um, well done for, for, for all the, the, the work that everyone's done through through this tricky time.